Jimmy's back. Jimmy's back from wherever you were. Where were you? <laughs> I went to Total Boat. Total Boat had this oh, that's right. super fun, really fun boat build off. And there was a test for them. They've been talking about it for a couple of years now. And they finally implemented it. And they asked 20 of us. It was about 20, 20 and change. I can't remember exactly. But it was a great mix of influencers and YouTubers and makers that are online. And uh, I mean, from Mike Clifford to, uh, I mean, obviously Derek and. I'm, I'm drawing a total blank, but there's a great little reel going around with everybody in it. Um, and four teams of five people, Lindsay Woodbrain was there. Uh, Stephanie on common outpost was there. Keith Mitchell. I mean, there's so many that come to me as I'm talking. And there was four teams and each team had about five, maybe more people. And we had to build a boat in two days and then on Sunday morning, take it out on a course and run it out to the buoy and back. Each one in the team had to take it once. So it was an even number of players on every team. We had to go out and around the buoy and back. And the funny thing was Tamara's on my team. Tamara, she used to be a myth buster. She weighs about eight pounds. And I'm like, it's going to be great. Tamara's going to ride our boat. She's going to take it out. We're going to win. We got the best boat. It's, it's the most agile. It's like a real boat. Everybody kind of made something somewhat jokey. And, it wasn't until about 10 minutes before we were going to do the race on Sunday morning when Mike, the owner of Total Boat, he says, he gets on the line. He goes, everybody has to take the boat one time around and that, that'll that that'll complete your obligation to potentially win. I looked at Derek. I'm like, what email was that in? I don't remember reading that. <laughs> Each one of us had to get in the boat. And so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So I had no plans of getting in this little tiny dinghy and paddling it. But I did. Each one of us had to go. Keith Johnson, Derek, me, Tamara, and uh, and Bobby Duke was on our team. It was it was a it was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun. So we had to go Bad. out around the buoy and back. We came in second place. We Keith Mitchell's team had the big banana. If anybody watched any of the uh, social media stuff about it, so those guys had a long, sleek boat. Keith is also a very well trained boat builder. He's built several boats. I each team had a an experienced boat builder. Michael Allen was the boat builder because he built one with Bourbon Moth years ago. So he was the boat builder on his team and I was the boat builder on my team. It was a lot of fun. And so that was like three pack full days of excitement and fun and laughs. And then on Sunday night, Derek and I drove up to Boston and flew to Cleveland. And in Cleveland, we were at welding school until Thursday. And then Thursday afternoon, we found out our flight got canceled early in the, early, actually late in the, in the morning, we found out our flight got canceled. And the next flight would have been Friday and we wouldn't have gotten back to Boston. We would have like flew through New York and the layover. And it was a long story. We just said, drive. We just like, we all looked at each other, went road trip. Then we went and rented a car and <laughs> drove. It was me and Derek and Lucas from Man Made and Dre from Crafts with Dre. The four of us drove home we got home at two in the morning the friday mm. morning and that was that it was fun cool. it was a great trip it was a really packed so for me it was exactly and then i got home friday evening so it was eight full days for me and then i, I the morning when we would have recorded this last week i had to be a class at 8 a.m there was like no if ends or buts we were in a class with about 20 people and each morning we went to the wipe off board and got some theory and then went out and practiced in the in the lab yeah. So, what were the, what were the classes about specifically? I mean, it, it's funny from my perspective <clears throat> because I think of you as like, yes, you know how to do all the welding. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, what mm-hmm. else, what else is there to learn for you? But well, um, I'm going to do some stories later today. Today, today is Wednesday. Um, I learned more theory about TIG welding and TIG welding aluminum specifically. I'm pretty okay with TIG welding all all phases that would be stainless regular steel or you know, common steel and then aluminum and the difference between steel or stainless steel is very similar but the difference between those two and aluminum is is considerably different and the settings and and uh, the amperage and how to handle it and the t- and the tungsten it's not all that complicated but hearing it from the teacher again and again and again and you know how to handle the puddle that's the puddle you make and and the technique and it's funny because i was and a shout out to to roy crumrine because i was posting my instagram stories and roy was giving me instructions through instagram and honestly i was getting better instruction from from roy because he's so well experienced uh just 
com- just like real practical experience. So Roy, thank you. And I, I definitely got got better. I definitely improved. The other day, I just said, you know what? In the middle of all my work on the pool table, I said, let me take a break and just see if I could take on my machine in aluminum. I got some aluminum scrap, and I was pretty good. It would have been in the past. I would have made a big problem. I would have made a puddle. Uh, I made that toolbox years ago, and and I left all the mistakes in it. I was going to spend hours grinding it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to be I'm going to show my mistakes, and then I'm going to do this again one day and show the improvement. And I might actually do exactly that. I'm going to just make that same exact toolbox over. I made that for Carolina. Yeah. So uh, after going to school and so on and so on, but it's also just also experience. But it was good. It was good to be in a class with several students. And we were all bouncing off each other. By the the third day, we were all talking. You know, the first couple of days, we we're all just like staring straight forward. No one's talking. <laughs> but a couple of days in, and a couple of days in the lab, and we went on a little tour of the facility and looking at the new equipment. It was definitely fun. It's it's definitely fun to get out there. But I'm behind on everything. But life life moves on. I'm working on the pool table. I got the pool table basically assembled on Instagram last night. Now it's up to Black Billiards to come in and do the details with the, the felt and assemble it. And then we can play a game of pool. So I'm really close. I'm just doing today. I'm doing some more details. That's awesome. It's going to be a sleek industrial look, wooden metal. And so today I'm going to do the finish on the, the sexy parts. But the mechanical parts, the physical parts are basically there. It's just set dressing at this point. Cool. And then uh, this week's video is going to be me repairing the corner of the graveyard house and that those two TikToks that I put up in the last couple weeks. So it's going to be that a little bit more in depth, a little bit slower, more explanation. So that's the video I'm working on this week. That's it. And life is good. I can't complain about it. Everything's going well. I mean, as good as it can be with algorithm ignoring you, things are okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a, a good trip. Yeah, it was definitely fun. The the car ride was hilarious. I bet. Tw- 12 hours in the car. Oh, Every man. time we stopped, Derek's like, let me go to the next rest stop, and then I'll let you drive. I said, okay, cool. And then he drove all the way. Nah. <laughs> That's what my wife and I do. <laughs> yeah. And I end up driving most of it. But. Well, David, what about you? Where'd you go this last week? Uh, uh, well, we went on a little mini vacation. Uh, we weren't too far from Jimmy on the east side of Cleveland at this little resort and went some went zip lining and and had some fun. So, I did get to leave the house wow. for a little bit. Were you actually in the city zip lining, or were you in the country? <laughs> no, this was. I think of Cleveland. It's, it's, I just think it, of concrete buildings. Yeah, it's 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 east of Cleveland. It's it's probably another hour uh, on the east side of Cleveland. And so that was fun. I never gone ziplining the only thing that i knew about ziplining was from bob's video from like 10 years ago where he made a zipline in his backyard <laughs> but um the only time i would ever be on a zipline is if they had to remove my incapacitated body from the top of a mountain which i would have climb. the funny thing is we we stopped by cedar point on the way there it's a big amusement park in in ohio and I hadn't been there in 29 years. I'm not really a roller coaster guy, and Kelly isn't really a roller coaster person either. And we're like, you know what? We haven't been there since the 90s. Let's let's just let's just see. Maybe we like roller coasters now. The answer is nope. <laughs> Don't care for roller coasters. <laughs> um, so we were just there for a couple hours on, on our way to our little vacation. But uh, before that and after that, I've been working on. Uh, some high-end speakers for our living room mm. so it's kind of like a it's a it's a four-part video not four different videos but f- four parts within the video and when one is like the the speaker build the technical aspect and how everything needs to be to spec then the second part is the veneering or mate the beautification of the speakers and then there's the and then there'll be a third part of the stand which is going to be very sculptural for the two speakers and then the the final thing will be the the grills for each speaker so the speaker themselves they are all high-end components and of course the outside well they're made with plywood but then they're kind of veneered with 
walnut, of course. And without the grills, they're pretty plain, just solid walnut with a acrylic face. And then I, the stands are going to be very sculptural. So if I, for whatever reason, I don't like the stands in the future, I could always replace them. And then the grills will, are going to have a vintage vibe to them. And if I don't like the way it looks, I can always replace the stand and the grills and the speakers will always be this kind of a classic look. So, and that's going to go into our living room. Awesome. And that's, that's actually not going to come out for another month. I've got two videos that are going to come out before that. So I've, it's one of those projects that's, I'm taking my time mm. and doing it because this is something I'm going to use and look at almost every day. So I, 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 I really care about this product project and I want it to look good. And the stands, I got to do some, speaking of welding, I got to break out the welder and, and make the the skeleton for the stands you're not going to see any of the metal within the speaker stands but w the idea that i have for the sculpture it needs like a strong internal skeleton so it's all metal and it's all going to get covered up with wood some hmm. experimental things i'll say yeah you know I, I saw last night um i looked at youtube for the first time <laughs> as a viewer <laughs> in a very long time and i saw your your uh, window the tv window thing and mm -hmm. i didn't get to watch it because i didn't watch anything as i was flipping through but how did that turn out like were you happy with i need to watch the video so that's on me and mm -hmm. that will probably answer my question but how did that turn out Are you happy that with turned it? out it looks phenomenal it looks really awesome. good um and it's so there's three tvs that make a window and it, it it's in my shop and it's a uh, sometimes I'm going to make it look like a window, like with some crazy background of like, oh, he's in the city or he's in a mountain range somewhere. And then sometimes you're going to play movies. And because of it's three TVs, there's a, there's a bezel in between there. And it's funny how quick your brain adapts to there being a bezel when watching a movie on there. And, oh, um, interesting. and it, it's all kind of framed with some Baltic birch plywood and then there's like a little windowsill and and all the electronics are hidden and it came out really good. I it was it's very satisfying. The as far as the performance of the video is not doing good, but the mm. but the actual project came out really great. Gotcha. Well now you have an opportunity to like make the image a concrete block wall or brick wall <laughs> or <laughs> grass or yeah. all sorts of weird things. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm, I'm definitely going to have some, some fun with that. And the, the funny thing is we did some trick photography for the video. So, uh, we, we put up some cherry wall paneling on the back wall of the shop. And then when we filmed any part of that, uh, area the camera was on a tripod so i was able to like mask out the middle of the video where i'm talking and the tvs are and on the outside i was able to use some adobe photoshop generation ai generative tools to make it look like there's furniture there and art hanging on the wall and oh, my man. my patreon listeners uh know I, I i warned them i'm like not everything in this video is real as far as like the the scenery and i don't know anything about effects i'm i'm not an effects type guy and if it was that easy for me to have a fake background in a video look real like you you can't believe anything that you see on the internet anymore. It's it, it's yeah. it's so easy to do. Yeah, I think that's going to be the case going forward. You just yeah. can't believe yeah. any of it anymore. Yeah, yeah. protect yourself. Yeah, cool. well, that's what I said well, the other day. You can't you can't believe anything unless you actually are physically there with the person watching them say it or do it. Yeah, it's 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 gonna it's gonna get dangerous. Like it's so easy to. Um, especially if you're a celebrity, your voice can just be sampled. It needs like 15 minutes, you know, the AI needs 15 minutes of your voice and then it can do anything that you want it to do. Mm -hmm. Video is on, on its way there now. I mean, there's deep fakes now, but you have to be really talented and have some high end computers to do deep fakes. But five years from now, you, you know, at the average teenager yeah. is going to be able to do that. Yeah. So yeah. I just want to ask Dave. This I'm looking at the video. It's a Photoshop still with the two blue chairs. That's fake. 
yeah so yeah <laughs> it's uh, so cool yeah so you uh so you you uh, i'll try to explain it quickly you you film on a tripod and yeah. then you take a still from that video you bring that into photoshop and you keep everything that's in the center but on the outside the new photoshop has this AI tool where you can just select it and replace it and it'll and so I'll say put in some modern oh, furniture and it will do that and then I bring that back into my video editing with a, with, with a window through the middle so you can with a window through the middle so yeah I'm, I'm yeah. masking out what I, the video that I want to keep and then the background is uh, the AI amazing. generated it's so stuff. amazing it's, it's bonkers it's it's silly and the TVs look amazing they really do create the depth of outside it's yeah really it's it's uh, it came out really really good the only thing that would make well i guess you kind of did it. i was going to say the only thing that would make that illusion better is if you inset it deeper than the surface of the the wall paneling that yeah that would be but uh, you kind of mimic that a little level. bit yeah yeah, yeah so there's that would be the only thing that would make it better yeah the curtains really kind of create that illusion yeah the the, the curtains really tie the room together <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, that's cool uh, I'm looking forward to, to watching that one. <clears throat> I will get to it. I apologize that I haven't seen it. <laughs> All good. You're a busy man. Um, so let's see. For me, last couple of weeks, man, what have I been doing? I don't even know. Last couple of weeks have been kind of crazy. Um, I did get the Plasma CNC running and nice. finally tested that and um, i put it off as long as i possibly could it was funny because i knew that it was ready to go but i kept coming up with different like just things to do instead of try it and i i don't typically that i'm aware of procrastinate on things but man i was feeling it that day i was just like i don't know like oh wait i didn't put the welding curtains up not that i have to have those but i could <laughs> and then i did it and then i was like oh wait i forgot to put the flashing on the ceiling so i don't burn the house down oh i'll take the curtains down and put the flashing up and then put the curtains up again and you know it was just like i kept coming up with excuses to, to put off trying it and then, i don't know why but just because it's new i guess but i finally got around to trying it did some really basic you know just had a little star had it cut out the star out of a piece of aluminum at first and it was a really gross cut and I realized I should probably start with steel because I think that would be a little bit. Yeah, I never cut aluminum. I know people can. I never did. Yeah, it it wasn't pretty, and I didn't go back to try it again yet. I just moved to a, some scrap steel, and just started cutting circles because I figured with a circle you can tell if there's an axis loose. You can tell that it's oblong. You mm -hmm. know, uh, which we found when we had built the CNC the first time, we didn't have one of the different axes like tightened up or squared or something. I don't remember what the deal was but you could see it in a circle and so I started doing a circle and did quite a few tests and got it working and tweaked a few things and um, I found that the kerf was beveled which I know happens sometimes but I don't think it always happens so I was asking people on Instagram about what might cause that or what you know people work around it and so i had a few your suggestions cut height sometimes helps that yeah cut height and the amount of air it sounded like mm. i might have too much air oh well, maybe um so i was going to ask you jimmy uh, as well mm. if you had any ideas for what that might be uh, typically else. cut height and uh you know you just gotta whatever the recommended air is for the for the machine you're using you just gotta set that but typically the cut height really has an effect on that and then also, really importantly, is the consumables. As the consumables mm -hmm. deteriorate, and you could have a perfectly new consumable and blow it by making a bad cut, and the, so now the consumables are aged prematurely, even on the really? third or fourth okay. cut ever made. Yeah, that happens sometimes where you, you get like a backfire, and then all of a sudden the consumables are spent or burnt. So, what do you look for there to see if they're spent? <clears throat> Um, well, some machines will tell you the consumables are having a problem, and then you take it all apart, clean them, wire brush them, and then put them back together. And that typically will solve them. I, I mean, I've milked a lot of time past its prime out of a set of consumables. I'm always rearranging them. I never throw them away. I always keep them in case I have absolutely nothing. And I have at least a, assembling, a semblance of parts I could throw back together on the tip. So you just got to look out for any hard melts. If you have a, the cone has several holes in it, you got to go back in there with like a needle and poke out, make sure all the holes are, are available. Mm. And your swirl cup, all these stupid little parts in the tip of your torch. And I'm sure maker to maker, they're variously different. Just got to make sure there's nothing broken. 
Nothing gotcha. broken or nothing super spent. There's like the one part I know in the Lincoln torch, it just comes straight down and it has a flat bottom. And that's where it's kind of like the back of the lightning bolt. And that wears out. It gets deeper and deeper. I've sometimes have taken that and given it a light sanding. And then it kind of brings the consumables back to a little bit more of a precise cut. Hmm. But you just got to remember, it's not a laser cutter and it's not a water jet. You're going to yeah. always have a little bit of a scrappy cut. But yeah. yeah. With, with and that's some another thing is, reason. Yeah, I don't have the experience to know like if the amount of bevel and slag on the backside of it, if, if that's normal or if mm-hmm. I need to adjust something. You I can just, just make a thing and just, so. I know in, in the TorchMate software, you could set the height. You have the pierce height, which is like usually a little bit different than the cut height. Mm-hmm. And then it'll, it'll pierce on the tail. That's why usually the pierces have a little bit of a blob around them and then it cuts into your, your vector and then follows the line. But I would just make like a square or a circle and try the pierce height and the cut height a couple of different ways. Yeah. And then you're going to get presets. A, you'll get a panel sometimes that has a bend in it. Yeah. And if you get a piece from the steel mill, there's always going to be a bump in it. And if you can't put a big chunk of steel on it to keep it flat, all these machines are meant to try and curve, follow that yeah. curve. And they never do. They never work properly ever. I guarantee you it's never going to work. It'll work the first time and then it'll never work again. <laughs> like, wow, that's cool. It went over the curve. And then every time the torch is going to bounce into the metal. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. sometimes what I'll do is I'll get it as flat as I can with clamps and steel if it's not nothing's in the way and then i will take a reading from the highest point so that the torch doesn't bottom out into that bump yeah. which i'm just talking just you know a couple couple sixteenths of an inch so if it doesn't bump into that part i'll make that the, the cut height and then everything else will be higher than that and the cut usually is okay it's passable hmm. you know if you're cutting eighth inch or i i find i cut most of the stuff i cut is not thicker than three eighths because we cut a lot of blacksmith tongs during the classes. We cut the tongs out, and then that's usually one of the things we do either at the Blackthorn. We haven't done it here in a while, where everybody gets to make their own set of tongs. So uh-huh. cutting out three eighths steel, and you get you get like a running start with the tong construction. Yeah, you know, So that's probably the most I have cut up to seven eighths one time. And the cut is super slow. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so I've been working on that, and I need, I think I need next to uh, make a specific thing. Like, you know, I did some test circles and stuff, and, and now I need I need a thing to prove whether I can make something exact. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, I yeah. need a project to try to create. And I have an idea. We've had this, this idea that we've been talking about for a long time um, to cut some pieces out for it on the plasma but that's just a small part of a bigger idea and we don't have the bigger idea ready yet so like i just got to come up with something else make a trailer but, hitch toilet i just saw that on instagram no oh, i have this uh I, I i have a cnc plasma cutter on the way a, a much much smaller one but i had this idea i got a book of like it's like origami paper shapes that you can fold into like oh. geometric things yeah. and i think it would be really cool to cut that out on on the CNC plasma cutter and then bend it and get all these awesome cool weird metal shapes so i think i mm-hmm. want to get uh it's it's one of the it, for me it feels like one of those tools that's going to cost me a lot of money cuz now i got to get some things to bend metal so, you know brakes yeah. or whatever they're called and then of course i'm going to want to get into some powder coating so i got to buy all that too now hmm yep um, Pepakura is the name for like the the process of making three dimensional objects out of paper. Say that again. Pepakura. Okay. Um, and there, I, there's a piece of software. I can't remember what it's called. I'll have to look it up. See if I can find it. I used it a long time ago, and it will take a three D model and turn it into a faceted surface and then basically be able to lay it out flat so that you can print it out on paper and then fold it into back into the three-dimensional shape. Mm -hmm. And so people do this all the time with props and stuff. So they'll have a helmet, you know, and they they can make the structure out of paper. And then once they've gotten it all glued up into the three-dimensional object, they can fiberglass it or whatever and make it into a, a thing that will last. But that whole process would be, I would assume, pretty similar. Um... You could probably use that same software to take a three-dimensional object and lay it flat and then 
take that vector and cut it on the on the plasma. So that might be something you want to look into. You know, yeah. it's kind of along the same lines, but the origami stuff doesn't. I mean, I guess it does become three dimensional. It's a, it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about the three dimensional. What is, what is object, the name of that 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 system? Pepakura. P e p a k u r a. If I remember correctly, I might be wrong about that spelling. Yeah, but. and and I think I'm, I'm I might be using the uh, the the word origami wrong. What I actually mean is like uh, um, I think packaging. I have a book on on packaging, and all it is is just different. Um, Oh yeah, things you can right. you can you can print out in paper and cardboard and fold it into these crazy crazy shapes. That's and so awesome. I'm gonna structural with packaging that. is the name of that book. Yeah, yeah. While that's cool. we're here, and, let, let me ask you guys a quick question. Um, what I asked you this in the text message and you both ignored me. No, it's okay. Don't worry. What? It's okay. <laughs> you probably didn't get it. We probably what, didn't see it. <laughs> yeah. What is the name of that? I ask you this on the podcast about once every eight months, and I write it on a piece of paper that goes away. Oh yeah. The website where I can make speed dials and rules and stuff. I is couldn't remember it, and that's block layer. Didn't respond. That's one of that's them. It. Okay, that is one I remember. N- that's not the one that that we were talking about, though. Um, oh, I have that bookmarked. Yeah. Oh. No, it, it, that is it. Yeah, it's block layer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you're right. All right that's it. Never mind. What were you going to say, Bob? I cut you off. I was going to say that I didn't respond because I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> no, no, no. Before that, I caught you off. We were still on the subject of the pepper cure. Oh, so like the it, getting the shape that you want, you know, unfolded, flat, ready to cut, and then cut is one thing. Folding that shape into the three dimensions with paper is fine because you can you can work with the folds that already exist or in place and everything, but with metal that's going to be really interesting to try to figure out your order of operations to put it in a break. You have to, you know, you can only bend yeah. it in certain right. orientations yeah, yeah, and stuff. flat spots. Yeah. Yeah. So that'll be interesting to see how you, I mean, depending on what shape you're going with, you know, I guess it'll be more complicated or less, but that seems like that would be the hardest part of that process is just figuring out the order of folding. But. Yeah. I, I mean, not everything has to come out of one sheet too. You know, it could be, multiple pieces put together uh another True. tool that i might have to spend some money on is a rivet gun and then uh, and learn how to weld really thin metal so i mm. see a, I, I see a whole bunch of uh potential with with some of yeah. these tools yeah definitely they unlock a whole series of skills that you got to attempt yeah um the other thing that i've been working on after the plasma cutter, is I've been out at the farm working on the Gia and replacing the floor pan. So on a Gia, I've told you all this before, but just to refresh, the there's no frame. There's a center channel. It's kind of like a looks like a like a giant eye. That's the center channel, and then the wheels and the engine and everything are attached to the eye, the flat parts of the eye, and so the floor pans are sheet metal that's welded inside each side of that eye and they are on pretty much every Volkswagen ever they're the first things to rust <clears throat> and they rust on every single one so in once I got the car separated out one of the things to do was to completely cut out these floor pans this is where the seats attach this is where your feet go this is everything and so I got them cut out this week got one of them welded in and the other one is ready to weld in I just ran out of welding gas. I was like, all right, time to get this done. No gas. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it was frustrating yesterday. But, um, so that's a pretty big step forward. It's, it's, there's still a huge amount of stuff in that chassis, that rolling chassis to clean up and, you know, it drives, the suspension works, the brakes worked. They don't know. Um, the engine works, and it's all on there. And so I could, and I ran through this with, in my mind yesterday, I could just like leave all that as it is and not mess with it, but then I'm like, I've got this thing so far down. Why would I not just go ahead and pull the front end apart and figure it all out and clean it all up and repaint it all and then put it back on, you know? But getting big progress done on the floor pans just kind of made me like, 
it's like I just kind of want to start putting it back together, but I don't want to rush mm-hmm. that process. You know what I mean? Because I put it back together halfway done, it's still going to be rusty on the inside. You just won't be able to see it. So anyway, it's exciting to have the floors moving along. Um, and then uh, on top of that, I've been working on body filler on the body, filling in some of the, the dents and the scratches and all that type of stuff, which is also cool to see but man that feels like an endless process that feels like something that you could just do forever because no matter how much you fill the top of that fill still has little scratches in it or still has a little low spot or it's not feathered to the body quite you know i don't know how long that's going to take you're muted jimmy i say you fill the hole with metal if it's a if it's a hole and then you put bondo on it and then you put the fine body filler on it then you put sanding primer and each one of those layers fills in the yeah. previous cracks so it's each one of them's finer and finer and finer yeah it could be it's you, when you do the first layer, you're like i'm done and then you realize you get so much more to do yeah not even close in any of the areas that i've covered none of them are done yet <laughs> they're just yeah. i'm on like layer two or three of them but so it's either way it's cool to see it moving along it it feels nice to to see progress there um but man, it really does feel like a still a long way from now before that thing is even close to being able to put it back together. One thing that was pretty cool though, having the floor pans done uh, will make it so that theoretically I could take, I could lift the body with a couple of people and put it back on the car just to make sure that everything fits. Hmm. You know, which is a necessary step at this point just to make sure that I don't have to undo any of my work so far. But I think doing that. And then if it fits, I think that will be a huge load off of the wondering for me about whether I've messed something up along the way or if it's like, oh, cool, it fits. Now I can take it apart and actually like really, you know, I can go toward the end. I can I can keep working and not worry about like, well, one of these days I'm going to have to figure out if I screwed up a year ago or not. <laughs> So. Why would it not fit? Because the the body mounts have moved around, or the body mounts part of the yeah. floor plan? Yeah, when I had to cut out the heater channels, um, I made the mistake of cutting both sides out at the same time. So then I didn't have a reference, oh. and the the whole body then was free to move and flex and stuff. And so then I, you know, I had to do my best to try to measure against the existing floor to get the body in its old shape, weld the new stuff in, and just hope that I have everything in the right place. Mm -hmm. Um, And then this kind of the same with putting in the floor pans. They they should fit in a certain space. You know, it's in a little, like, um, it's in the side of an eye, so it's kind of a a three-sided rectangle that it has to fit in. But you still have to trim the pieces to fit in there. And if I trim too much off the front, then it's going to be too far back, or, you know, whatever. It's going to be too far forward. So there's always a possibility that putting those in, I didn't get it all lined up. And I don't know how much slop, how much grace there is in between the holes on the floor and on the body. It could be that they made it so that you've got, you know, half an inch in every direction that you can just like put it on there and slide it around and then bolt it together. I don't I don't know yet. So being able to test that. Um, And then, you know, obviously I'll have to take it back apart and everything, but being able to test that fit between the two big chunks, I think will give me some peace of mind as to whether I should throw it all away and buy another one or if I'm good to go. (laughs) So. You only need uh, a bunch of human beings to help you pick it up and move it and that's it. Yeah. I actually, I've seen videos of people of two people picking one of those bodies up before. I don't think I would do that, but they're not, they're not especially heavy. So um, I think probably four people would be enough to, just lift it off of the cart right next, you know, move it over five feet and set it down. Um, but I don't know. There's, there's, it's a weird combination of getting stuff done and feeling, looking at that piece you just put in, thing you just cut out and replace, and you're like, yeah. And then you look two inches to the left and you're like, oh man, <laughs> two inches to the right. And you're like, oh man, there's just so much to do on that thing. It is, in this video, I've got an idea for making it a little bit different um, because it's it's you know it's welding, it's cutting and welding and grinding. But I actually want to talk about in the video, make it a more about the idea of why any of us are willing to put in 
this much work to anything. Like, why are we willing to work hard and, and stick with something that is not easy? You know, um, I, I talked about it. Uh, well, me, me and Derek are doing a little a Patreon podcast. I talked about it on that, how it's a little bit of an obsession <clears throat> to try and finish mm-hmm. something. Because Derek always compliments me that I finish stuff and he never finishes stuff. And I said, for me, it's become more of an obsession. I get a little OCD, like when you want to, some people are OCD about keeping their workspace neat. And I wish I had that more than I had the other one, but I have a little bit of an OCD of when there's half built projects sitting around. It's more Mm. of a compulsion to finish them because I've made the world on correct. It's me. It's like I'm the one that took apart the vacuum cleaner as a little kid. And the parts were sitting around and, you know, I wasted the money, my mother's money. So I have a little bit of that self-inflicted guilt. Like, okay, I've started this. I created this wormhole in space. I have to make it right. Yeah. It's it's a little bit of that. Gotcha. Uh, speaking of um, of Derek, you were telling us a story at the beginning about you guys watching TV together. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> the kind of prompted today's topic. Me and Derek were laying in the hotel room together, like, trying to get to sleep because we had to get up super early every morning. And then every night we dilly-dallied and we're like, oh, you're not going to get any sleep. And Willy Wonka was on. And I, I love Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the first one, the real one, the one with Gene Wilder. And... I was about to flip past it because I assumed Derek wouldn't be interested in it. And I was so wrong. He's like, oh, my God, this is the best movie of all time. He goes, leave it on. And then we sat there and watched. Really, we actually ended up, that's what put us to sleep. And the I was just f- laughing at the fact that no matter where you go in life, it's these childhood things that continuously tug at you. And Derek was like, are you crazy? Willy Wonka is like, it's the only thing. It's like, it's. He, I was so impressed that he really use it as a he's like it's so funny like he's like this is this is like to find a childhood and then you know with the passing of Pee Wee Herman how much of us had that same thing with Pee Wee Herman I remember Pee Wee Herman had an HBO special and me and my brothers would like sit my, me and my brother John Joey was in the Marine Corps at that point he didn't care about Pee Wee Herman but <clears throat> me and John would uh, watch over and over and over again with the Pee Wee Herman special that became the Pee Wee's Playhouse once it was made for kids does, you, does that ring a bell for you guys? The Pee Wee's, the Pee Wee's HBO specials that would come on? They were old. They were like dirty and adult. Yeah, I knew of it. I mean, I I watched Pee Wee's Playhouse, but I knew that there was something yeah. before that that wasn't for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was uh, Jambi, the guy in the box, and and Sailor Bill, which ended up becoming uh, Phil Hartman. It was Phil Hartman early on. And I remember when Saturday Night Live had Phil Hartman on. I'm like, it's Sailor Bill. Oh my God, it's Sailor <laughs> Bill. Yeah, it was Lawrence Fishburne was on there. The Cowboy. There were all sorts. Yes, of people. it was crazy. It was crazy. So I mean, I, I it prompted the topic of what are some of the the childhood fun interesting things that we watched as kids like the child entertainment that we watched that inspire us today and i could honestly say i tell it all i say it all the time when people say like what is your knife making style i was like i want to make a knife that looks like bugs bunny would pull it out and try and scare somebody so i always say my my <laughs> knife the way i make knives is i want it to look like it came from a bugs bunny cartoon those are that's my knife style so i make these big kitchen knives with this like extraordinarily extra thick heel and <clears throat> kind of an odd shape point in and anything i make in the workshop i'm constantly thinking of chitty chitty bang bang anytime i work on a car you know it's a fantasy is to work on a, a chitty chitty bang bang t- style car and and these things are constantly in the background and when when it comes to trying to be cool and like look cool you want to look like michael Corleone. you know everything is like inspired by the godfather so i, I always laugh when people say what are your favorite movies i say my favorite movies are basically in order would be Willy Wonka, The Godfather, Young Frankenstein, and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Like those are like oh, the movies. Young that Frankenstein. Oh, <laughs> it's the best. I love it. <laughs> it's the best. Uh, when me and Graz are working together, we were constantly like looking at clips of Young Frankenstein to get that goofy mood going. And we were watching. There's a, there's a whole funny series of outtakes of Young Frankenstein that I recently watched the other day with my friend, and. We would die and laugh. And they're like, what's funnier and more entertaining than Young Frankenstein? So Bugs Bunny, uh, 
I always joke about Mr. Magoo. I remember like Mr. Magoo was kind of like, as I became aware of TV, my mother would plot me in front of the TV and I was watching Mr. Magoo, like driving his Model T across steel I-beams and like always falling right into, always being safe, even though he was, so all these stupid, dumb things. And now we're, we're basically almost a generation apart, me and you guys. And uh, that's why I said, when I said Willy Wonka, I said, not the, not the phony Willy Wonka, the real Willy Wonka. <laughs> now, and then now there's a third Willy Wonka, which is going to be so confusing in a few years. Yeah. Like your kids are going to be watching this Willy Wonka. He says Timothy Chalamet. Is that who it is? I, something. I don't know what his last name is. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> the Dune guy. So what are some of the influences that you guys, like we could just go down memory lane. I think mine are pretty obvious. David, what are... <laughs> <laughs> no, they're not. They're not to me. Um, I haven't made... Oh, Star Wars. Star Wars, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It's not the only one, but David, go ahead. I haven't made a connection between the things that really impacted me and what I do now, but I have seen the Indiana Jones movies dozens and dozens of times. It's my that and and back to the future they are my background movies like i constantly Mm. have something on in the background when i'm working by myself and those six movies are there there's something that's really comforting comforting about them and it just kind of puts me at ease just because i know what's going to happen i you know i've I really love the, the the characters in there, but I have no idea what the connection is to what I do now. But there's got to be there's got to be something. Um, and then uh, the the oddball in there is, is Goodfellas for me. That's another movie that I've oh, just yeah. seen over. Oh yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's so quotable. Is there's so many? It's like th- that movie. Each particular each scene is its own movie. You know, either, you know, the Joe Pesci, like uh, uh, clown scene, like that's one thing. And then the, you know, right. like, it, like uh, it's uh, the scene with his mother, with, with Joe Pesci's mother. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a deer. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, uh, but I, I, I feel like they have shaped me in some way and I, and I don't know what it is going back to the PB Herman thing. Um, there's an artist that I follow now who I just absolutely adore. Uh, His name is Wayne White, and he was one of the set designers on the P.V. Herman TV show, the the kids' show. And I I look at what he did and what he does now, and that is just insanely inspiring to me. Um, But again, I'm like, I'm struggling to find the connection, but I know there's something there because they they mean so much Well, it's funny, as I got older, I'm thinking of like how carefree and fun somebody like Willy Wonka is, right? He's a creative genius, obviously, and he could do, you know, the character, obviously. And then, in in a way, Gene Wilder was the same way. You know, Gene Wilder had lived a really fun, carefree life, obviously. He was just a regular person, but the characters he played basically kind of magnified him as an actor. Um, <clears throat> going into real life, as I became an artist and a designer, I started thinking of... You know, you see someone like Picasso as as he got older, he just like never wore shoes and he was always jumping around playing in his studio. And then I started being more cognizant of people like Andy Warhol that just played in his studio all the time. And they lived these fantasy lives like Willy Wonka and like, you know, the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. I can't remember Dick Van Dyke's name in that movie. You You see these characters and those are cartoons presented to me as a child but then you started seeing real life people being able to live that fantasy lifestyle and that's that's really how i was able to make the connection and really have these things start to inspire Mm -hmm. the life that i want to leave you know consciously or unconsciously when people would always say to me what 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 is your ultimate goal i says to make art and sell it and in a way that's what i've achieved and when i really sit and analyze it it's it's like the connections that i made as i got older from like these heroes that I had and then these people living that same type of hero lifestyle that I was watching, you know, what does Bugs Bunny do? He just walks around, does whatever he wants and goofs with people. (laughs) Like like Bugs Bunny would be an auditor right now. Like he'd be walking around with a camera pecking on the police. (laughs) Uh, It's, it's these type of just like free and easy fun lifestyles that I was exposed to early on that inspired me. 
and and hmm. starting to see true examples of them. Yeah. Well, I think I mean for me, it, I, I'm kind of as you guys are talking about it, I'm kind of breaking it into two little categories because I was trying to I was trying to think of something other than Star Wars because I think that's pretty obvious. But at the same time, Star Wars and a bunch of the movies that were similar to that in in like escapism and about you know just a far off place like a different world a lot of those really drew me in tron was a big one for me because it was just like visually at the time was totally different and really i'm not sure why but it really made an impact on me as as like um as a as an opportunity to there's there's other stuff there's more interesting things than what are right in front of you sometimes Hmm. and so i think star wars was that from a far off place tron was that from a inside the machine like you know right here there's there's more interesting things happening that we can't see and so i think a lot of the aesthetic of both of those things carried over but then i also think about i loved when i was growing up my and i've said this i think before my three favorite characters that I didn't realize at the time were Batman, Iron Man, no, nah, f- sorry, four. Batman, Iron Man, Sherlock Holmes, and James Bond. Those four all kind of became like identities that I wasn't trying to replicate, but I like, I really like this thing about like Batman could, he just had everything at his fingertips. He could try everything. Iron Man funny, could yeah. make anything for me it was uh, the batman from the 60s it was kind of a goofball but it was yeah. still it was, you know batman and robin so i mean i paid attention to batman and comic books in the 80s and he was the moody detective you know um but i think those and then james bond was like just tough and smooth sherlock holmes was super aware and i've thought about this a lot over the years why those four stuck out to me and I think I really latched on to this, those four stories, the first two being comic books and the other two being movies and books. I latched on to those stories for different reasons, but they still are characters that I'm just really drawn to for those same reasons. You know, I, I, I love the idea of being able to make anything, and that's kind of the pursuit of all of this stuff that we're doing and all of the tools. is like at any time, I would love to be able to have what I need to just go, I have an idea, go make the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I also think it's really important to be aware of your surroundings and to be, you know, to have an awareness of people and what they're doing and how they feel and what they're into. And I feel like that's a Sherlock Holmes thing. And so, like, I think all four of those characters yeah. really rubbed off James on me. Bond in a is also way. A, James Bond, definitely a big one for me. Yeah. Sean Connery. The sh- and then after mm-hmm. Sean Connery, I never could get into any of the other James Bond guys. It's because yeah. that's the one I watched when I was younger and with my brothers. Because that was like they repeat them on TV occasionally. Yeah, and the aesthetics in James Bond movies, even the ones that I don't really, because I'm with you, I don't really care for all the different Bond actors. But man, the aesthetic of those movies, like they are stylistic mm-hmm. to a fault. You know, each one has its own just all the furniture, all the sets, all the clothes, all of the things are this year <laughs> and the, ne- the next one is very firmly this year and it's really right. cool to go back and watch them and all the techniques about how the villains murdered people was also hilarious yeah, it's like, that's true yeah. just put a bullet in his head and stop with this like i'm gonna i'm gonna go yeah. eat a sandwich while the laser cuts you in half. lasers are new let's put a laser in my yeah um yeah so i think those are those are probably the four big characters for me but uh you know genre science fiction just in general between like tron and, and star wars and I think both just had a big effect on the look that I like, you know, mm-hmm. probably. Um, but then I also, you know, the other side of that is I watched tons of cartoons when I was growing up. Transformers, G.I. Joe, there were all these other ones that were around the same time that I was into, and they all had this, I don't know, really specific look and, you know, motivation to them and... Uh, I don't know. Those things all have a little bit of impression on me, for sure, still to today. And it's interesting that you can like something when you're a kid, and like you can like it, and then it's over with. And there's certain things that you can like, and they really stick with you for a really long time. 
and I can't quite identify how Transformers as a kid sticks with me now, but I know it's there, but I don't, I'm not exactly sure how. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, well, all these things definitely inspire us as artists. The, like, I'm not big into Transformers, but I did work on the toys when we, we used to make keychain versions of them. Mm. And I was constantly like taking the sculptures and having to like make the thing go and fold and unfold. And some of them we sold a series where they didn't fold because it was cheaper and they were either the, you know, they were the robots. And, but just the mechanics of it and the idea of thing, the idea, uh, when I was a kid, we had, um, they might have actually been called Transformers. I'm trying to remember what they were called. It was a, it was a Volkswagen bug that pushed together with like a spring. Like, so it was a Volkswagen bug, right? And you push like the bumper or the tailgate and it would go and open up and extend. It was spring loaded and turn into a hot rod. But then you'd push huh. front. It was probably made in 1970 by some toy kind of maybe marks or something. And you push it from front to back. You push the bumpers together and mechanically would all fold back into the hood. So for me, those were Transformers. I'm pretty sure that's what it was called. And they were toys from the early 70s. And there was two or three styles. But I remember I had the, it's probably in my mother's house still. And it had a key in the side. So you wind it up and you could shoot it off. It was half plastic, half metal. The mechanism was all stamped metal from Japan, and the exterior was injection molded. And uh, so I always see the Transformers movie, and I see, I remember the original toy that I had was called Transformers before every movie, every toy was attached to a movie uh, property. Crazy. Yeah. Hmm. We couldn't afford yeah, Transformers, so we had we had to buy used GoBots. I don't know if you remember the GoBots. Go but... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. So I have a question now that we didn't talk about this, but... Um, so now that we've all identified some of the stuff that inspired us, that has continued to inspire us, do you do you surround yourself with that stuff on purpose now? I know I do, and that's I, I think I, I why 100% I'm hundred percent too. Yeah. In what ways? Uh, it's funny. I just was um, I was cleaning my shop the other day, and I was like, "Oh, there's Mr. Robot." I had it in. The, I bought it at the flea market. And it's a little mechanical robot from like 1975. It's a clear plastic thing, and its head is a silhouette of a man with a top hat on. And when it walks, it's got all these moving gears inside of it. And the arms don't necessarily walk, but they're kind of a, it looks like an Izzy Swan toy. Like it's like the arms are like attached to rotating things. And I saw it yesterday, and I was like, I got to bring that and put it front and center. Like, why is it hiding back here? Just things just get shuffled around during the TV show, and it gets shuffled and put behind something. And I keep that stuff around me because it's it's sending me good vibes. Mm-hmm. If you could uh, if you could relate, it's just sending me good. Don't forget about this, and don't forget to do that, and don't forget to add that, and don't forget to be, don't forget to not be serious, and don't forget to be silly, and don't forget to. Hmm. Think of a fun mechanical solution to get to your it, it, your solutions to your problems could be fun and meandering. They don't have to be so direct. Sometimes it's appropriate, and sometimes it's more fun to just take a meandering approach, a playful approach, and having these toys around and remembering these movies. And it was funny the other night when Willy Wonka came on. I was like, I want. I'm like, Shh, I want to watch Willy Wonka, but Derek's not going to want to watch it. And he's like, No, 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 leave it on. I was like, oh, Okay. <laughs> well, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I'll guess if you want to watch it. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's important. David, what about you? Do you do you keep the stuff around you? So, uh, I like to surround myself with things that meant a lot as a, as, as a child. Maybe not. So, I, I I collect books, and I have hundreds of books because I just feel like there's something magical about about a physical book that doesn't it's not as important now as it was then and then records and cassettes like there's of course listening streaming something on on spotify or apple music is much easier but i like the i like the there's a it was a little bit more effort to take a record and throw it on the record player, put a cassette into the cassette player. And then there's the, the, the smell, the smell of cassettes just remind me of childhood. And then looking at that and reading all the, all the fine print while listening to the album. Um, and I, so the other day I was like 
looking on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist for an Atari ST computer because the Atari computers was my first computer that I had growing up. I had just happened to come across a video on YouTube. Somehow YouTube knows that I wanted to watch a video on a 1980s Atari computer. And I was like, oh yeah, I got to have one because that just made it just made me feel good it reminds me of childhood i could run an i could run an emulator on my computer now and have the same experience yeah. but for some reason right. at that moment i felt like i had to buy that atari computer and thankfully i couldn't find one um because <laughs> it would just be taking up space but yeah i do like to surround yeah. myself with those tools or those those items like yes last night i just developed a bunch of uh rolls of film like that's not a common thing. Oh and yeah, that was a great. That's an actual photograph. It, it, one of us yeah. online. It's a great picture. Yeah, it was an actual photograph uh, with film. That's beautiful. And I just love the. I love the techniques. I love the the, the smell and and the hands on because it just reminds me of of. Um, I, I didn't develop learning. film as a child, but I took pictures as a child, and then in high school I took photography, in college I took photography, and so I love I love the the actual process of all that. Yeah, I surround myself quite a bit with things that I don't need that just make me feel like a kid again. Right. I just Isn't sent you guys weird? a picture. I sent you guys a picture. It's called the Imposters, and that's the from like imposters. 1973 or four. And then GoBots came out. So, and I just sent you a second picture, which shows huh. the imposter Volkswagen bug I was talking about, and then the one Dave you were talking about. And then oh, they're yeah, a couple years apart. One. And then obviously during one of the movies, there's what is the name of the yellow beetle in Transformers? It's a Bumblebee. Bumblebee is another version of a yellow Volkswagen bug yeah. that transforms. Huh. So the one I was talking about was the first one. Yeah. Because it was huh. definitely like 1969, 1970. And then GoBots and then Bumblebee. So, so this little article here says, I'll send you the article if you're curious. It says, why, does there, why is this recurring theme of Volkswagen bugs? That's funny. It was just such a ubiquitous car. Yeah. I, guess. yeah. I mean, it's crazy. Like it's the sleeper, like the thing you don't expect. Yeah. That's funny. Um, uh, you, you talked about the smell of the, the thing. It's funny how, and really strange, how smells can be one of the things that can cause a memory. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've had this, like, with your tools or toys or anything like that. Yesterday, I went to, <clears throat> we have this little, like, kind of inexpensive uh, grocery store called Priceless, and it's, you know, it's like a discount grocery store. And we'll go in there and get milk and things like that that we know are a couple of days old. Like, n you know, <laughs> not like old. <laughs> They're like, okay to get. Um, so anyway, so I walk in the store yesterday, and for some reason, it had this smell. And it wasn't a great smell, it, but it was a smell that immediately took me back to when I was a kid we uh, I would spend a week at my grandparents house in about 30 minutes from here in this really small town where my mom grew up and their grocery store was similar to this in that it was just a kind of a cheap small grocery store but it had this this like gas station-y kind of 7-eleven smell you know like the places that just barely get cleaned enough mm -hmm. to like be passable but when you go in you know there's food and that smell and for some reason for the first time this place in my town had that smell yesterday and i was immediately taken back to these summer weeks at my grandparents house where i would get mm. to like walk into town and go to this place to buy candy or whatever and it was just a really strange not a smell i would have remembered otherwise <laughs> but it was interesting how a smell could take you back to a very specific moment. The the inside of um, uh, my Impala has a very distinct smell, and it smells like my childhood because you know the car belonged to my dad, and I just remember like trips to Cleveland to go see a baseball game, or you know when we went swimming at the at, at the quarry or whatever. It just instantly like it's an and it's a really strong smell, and it just instantly takes me back. Hmm. Our house has that has a smell like that, and we've lived here for six years now. And when we're gone for a weekend or something like that, more than you know, a day in or out, when I walk back into the house, it smells like my grandparents' house, not like my house. Mm. It smells like it did in the mm -hmm. '80s, and and it goes away so quickly. Like you, I walk in that first whiff, I'm like, oh wow, and then it's gone. 
I can always kind of look forward to that little mm-hmm. moment. And my kids and my wife, they don't know that smell. So it doesn't mean anything mm-hmm. to them. You know, they don't have that point of reference, that memory that gets pulled up. But yeah, that first whiff when I come back in after a weekend or a trip or something, it's pretty neat. Anyway, any other thoughts on uh, nostalgia, on, on things that inspired us, that stay with us? It's funny, as we talked, I realized there's so many more things that inspire my present day creativity. Like what? Uh, well, it, when it comes to filmmaking and movie making, Dave brought up Goodfellas, and you know, there's so many camera moves and stuff like that that inspire me making. I, I thought the other day, I haven't done it yet. I haven't, I mean, me and my brothers used to do it as a joke, but the idea of doing more completely scripted, silly things is the type of thing. Like, I, I've only been just documenting me making things and thinking in terms of like Monty Python. Like, Monty Python mm-hmm. was like a huge inspiration for me as a kid, and so many people. Like doing like Monty Python skits and trying to write funny comedy bits that are 20 seconds long and, you know, stuff like that. Like you see more of these silly stage TikTok things. And, and you know, with my cast of characters, like we hung out with Bobby, Bobby Duke the other day. And, you know, there's, there's no funnier person in this world than Bobby Duke. And yeah. If you could wrangle him and, and write a funny script for him and Derek and, and even Nicole, we, we had so many laughs the other day driving around and when we were in, in Rhode Island. And it just inspired by the movie's regular movies we watch and how those movies inspire us as movie makers now you know for better or for worse all three of us are movie makers are you do you guys find more inspiration in things current or in things of from the past i think it's a little of everything it's it's really interesting like you know you get stuck on a crazy mr beast thing and you're like oh my god i can't believe you did that like i should be buying a train and dropping it into a hole <laughs> no no no, no i can't i can't do that <laughs> i try to like buy a little tiny train that won't be as exciting uh versus you know oh let me stop on willy wonka again and then a funny little bit me and derek kind of obsessed about this opening scene where gene wilder walks out and his cane gets stuck in the concrete and then he rolls and stands up and while we were watching the movie, I opened up uh, Wikipedia and started reading about this. Sh- you know, Willy Wonka was made to advertise Willy Wonka candy. Mm-hmm. General Mills put up the money for it. It was an advertisement, mm. and that's when the, that's when. I mean, obviously, it's derived from the book originally, but the idea of taking the name from the book to make a candy factory, a candy company. But when Gene Wilder was cast in the part. He says, I'll take the, after reading the script and everything, he's like, I'll take the part. He was definitely the guy they wanted. They didn't want to look at anybody else. He's like, I'll take the part under one condition that you let me have fun with this opening scene. And he, and he wrote the scene where he walks out with the cane and the cane gets stuck in the bricks. And then he pretends like he's going to fall, but then he roars and tumbles. And he says, and they said, okay. They said, if that's what you want to do. They said, but why? And he said, I want to, so that the rest of the episodes, nobody knows when I'm lying or telling the truth. And it creates that mystique playfulness of Willy Wonka. Huh. So it's an interesting little read on Wikipedia. Cool. But stuff like that inspires everything we do now, it inspires me, everything I do. I think old stuff from my childhood or just from growing up still is more inspirational to me than the things that I see today. And I think that's not necessarily a fault of the current stuff. I think that's just, I react to nostalgia more than I do to, you know, cause everything that I take in now is being taken in along with life. And my life now is far more complicated and condensed and hectic than it was when I was a kid. So the things that got through my eyes and ears as a kid were like the only thing that got through at that moment. Now it's like, yeah, but taxes and soccer schedules and dinner and, you know, it's like a cool movie is a cool movie. And and it only makes it so far for me usually these days, which I guess is kind of a shame. But I think that's the case for me. What about you? I think... um I think I pull in more inspiration from things now. I'd like, I'm on my fourth time watching Mad Men. It is my all time favorite TV show. And it's not a current show, Mm. but it's, you know, it's, I don't know, 10 years old now. Um, And there's 
And when I watch that, it reminds me of working for ad agencies, you know, before I did this YouTube thing. And it takes me back to what I loved about working at ad agencies and what I hated about it. And then it mixes this aesthetic that I just absolutely love, like the the whole mid-century modern thing, uh, you know, the walnut furniture. Like I just I just love all that. So I take a lot of inspiration from that show, and but it does bring me back to a time, you know, 15 years ago, and I think there's so much input happening in my life all the time: TV shows, movies, YouTube physical things like art museums and and thrift stores and antique stores um I, I think more of my inspiration comes from things that i see every day every day now but i think a lot of those things have a direct connection to a past and sometimes it's not a past that i'm even familiar with but i just i can i, sure. I relate to somehow Interesting. and i didn't get started huh. i didn't make things until my 30s like i didn't grow up playing with legos and i didn't have a bandsaw when i was 10 years old like like, like jimmy um <laughs> and i really didn't <laughs> didn't make physical things until my mid-30s so I, it, it's it's i think it's a little different for me that you remind me because of james bond and, and i'm just reading a comment that somebody sent me a direct message yesterday i was fiddling through one of my storage containers and i found a knife and a cane that I made in 1984. I was 17 years old, 16 years old. I made it, and on the bottom I said, made by me in 1984, and it's a knife that gets clicked into a cane. And that's directly from watching James Bond and Secret Weapons by Q, when he would go through yeah. Q's lab. It's a direct, direct, direct connection. Mm. And I made like five more, and my friend says, oh, that's really cool. And just I texted with my friend just now. I was like, I'm going to find a few more, and I'll show them on Instagram next. Because I know there's another one that I made around that same time. So I was getting hmm. obsessed with knives and canes directly because of watching these secret FBI, you know, whatever. What is it? Not FBI. MI6. MI6 stuff. Yep. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. And you mentioned Lego. And that's something I didn't even pull into this conversation, but absolutely. 100%. Like, I'm not Lego obsessed, but I had Legos as a kid. I had Legos yeah. before they made kits. You'd buy you'd buy them by the piece count. And those I are think the kits that I had. I both I both react when I think about it. I react to the the actual bricks, the building process, but also the aesthetic of the packaging and the ads and there was a certain feeling about the early 80s and me and Lego. And I didn't even pull that in when we were talking about this, but absolutely, that's another one. Uh, you also mentioned something that I don't even remember how I thought of it, but a movie that you probably want to watch just for the setting and for the furniture is the original Parent Trap. Okay. It's tough to get through <laughs> because you know it's a it's a '60s Disney thing. I mean, it's actually a pretty. Is that fun Jodie movie. Foster? No, uh, I don't remember her name. It was uh, it's not Jodie Foster. I don't remember her name. But I, um, I remember all those early Disney movies. Those were all very branded movies. But the, Herbie that the Love one, Bug and all we, that stuff. We watched... Oh, I'll tell you about the Herbie in the mm. after show. Um, mm. So that movie, we watched it with the kids a year or two ago or something. And there's this, the whole beginning of it. It's at a camp. And then they end up back in Southern California at, this, at the dad's mm -hmm. house. And it is like... I remember watching this a couple years ago going, oh, dude, like that house is awesome. And it's straight mid 60s. I'm seeing. Just, it was the coolest house it's at like the time. The yeah, yeah, yeah. It was before that. Wow. But yeah, anyway, you should you should at least watch the section of just to see the. There's a great little the preview on the IMDb thing. channel for the original Parent Trap. And I, I see exactly what you're talking about. And the Brady Bunch house yeah. is. Uh, uh, it is inspiring me inspiring for me as, mm. as well but yeah there's just something i wasn't even alive during that time but there's something about those things that speak to yeah. me and it's and I'm, it's probably because my grandparents had some of that similar furniture um you know mm. there was a uh you know my 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 grandpa on my mom's side was like this super tall very handsome nice hair dude kind of like a don draper he wasn't in it he wasn't in advertising in advertising but he had that like don draper type type feel to it so i don't know 
I don't have to have a direct connection for me to just be in absolute love with something from decades ago. Yeah, absolutely not. Awesome. Well, I'm going to thank our Patreon supporters. And then you can tell me something that you're interested in, something you've been watching. Uh, big thanks to everybody over at Patreon for supporting the show. We are super grateful for everybody over there uh, at every level. It, it all It's all helpful for us to make the show. Uh, and everybody over there at every level gets the after show. But, of course, there's people that go above and beyond. I always have to thank them because they're awesome. So big thanks to Crabtree Creative, The Web Ranchwood Works, Michael Menegin, Warren Works, Stu Morrison, The New Janky Workshop, Scott Orm, Sean Beckner, Odin Leather Goods, Rich at Lowen Designs, Chad's Custom Creations, Chad from Mancrafting, Works by Solo, <laughs> Works by Solo, sorry Bernie, Albers Woodworks, and Corey Ward. But then we had some new patrons this week, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, like Ethan Moore. Ethan, I hope I'm saying your last name right, but big thanks to Ethan for hopping on and supporting the show. Uh, if you want to get the after show, which is a separate podcast feed, after this one, you can go to patreon.com slash making it. Join up at any level over there. It helps us make the show, and we are really grateful for it. So go check that out. Big thanks to everybody that, that supports us over there. All right. You guys have mm-hmm. anything to recommend this week? I'll... You go first. Uh, so, one one of my favorite artists is Wayne White, and I'm holding up a book. A lot of what he does now is he takes these thrift store paintings and then paints words over top of them, and they're they're really cool. But he also has some like physical like cardboard sculptures. Oh, uh, he wow. was a set designer and prop designer on Pee Wee Herman's show. And there's a movie that I, I, I don't see it on any streaming services, but it's worth the four dollars and ninety nine cents to rent it called it, Beauty is Embarrassing. It is so good. It's the movie that made me fall in love with it's a doc. And it it and it goes through the P. V. Herman stuff and what he's doing now as a as an older gentleman and artist and he's just so creative. Uh if you look his Instagram's great, so if you're thinking about, like, if you want to buy his book, check out his Instagram, and then if you like that, then go and get the book as well, but just, uh, I just, he, just art for the sake of art, not, nothing, nothing functional, although there are some pieces with some mechanical movements and stuff that he does, and it's just, it's just hmm. phenomenal stuff. Wayne White. Cool. Wayne White. Okay. Jimmy, what you got? I just want to also wish, I want to recommend Mr. Pete, Mr. Pete 222, Tubal Kane. That's Mr. Pete. He's the machinist shop teacher, and today is his 80th birthday. So if you don't know Mr. Pete, oh. go wish him a happy birthday on his 80th birthday. He's, uh, talk about when I very first started watching YouTube, he was like my shop teacher he's amazing and i remember the feeling i I talked about it online so some old fans will remember me talking about this i remember when so taylor and i were going to go to chicago this is 10 years ago and she tried to set up an appointment so i could watch mr pete or go visit him in a shop and he wrote back no shop visits ever thank you no thank you and that was when he first started on youtube so it was when he was kind of early on youtube and he was like, I'm not going to interact with strange weirdos from the internet. But now the community is so, like, cracked wide open that one day he commented on one of my YouTube videos, and it was very complimentary, and I couldn't believe it. I, I screen grabbed it, and it's on my Instagram from five years ago, it was 10 years ago. And I was so honored that he acknowledged me as a, as a fan the way I acknowledge him as a fan. So Mr. Pete is very special to me, and uh, I remember writing him personally and i told him that experience i said like five years ago i wanted to visit you and my girlfriend tried to surprise you and you said no visits ever and he was really embarrassed about it he's like i'm sorry because i just i was scared of the internet i didn't know better he goes i'm totally open to meeting new friends now and long story short mr pete is an amazing teacher he's an old curmudgeon he's a lovable old Mm. man go check him out and go wish him a happy birthday and tell tell him if you go into his comment section say jimmy duras to send you (laughs) birthday wishes will do nice August 2nd is his birthday, and this will be like August 5th or 6th when this comes out. Yeah. Cool. 
Uh, mine is an Instagram account that I found recently, and <clears throat> it's called Annie's VW. And this lady, I don't know anything about her other than she is uh, rebuilding a bug. Looks to be by herself. And so I've been following her on Instagram for a while, and man, she is doing all the work that I'm going to have to do <laughs> on the Gia. And it's really pretty inspiring to watch because she's just, she's taking everything down to bare metal, you know, by hand and, and she's doing all the metal work. And I don't know what her background is, like if she has experience with this stuff or whatever, but she's doing great work. And um, it's just one of those things that by watching somebody else make progress, it's inspiring me to make progress on my own project. Um, and I'm learning stuff from watching her do it as well, so. Go check out Annie's VW. I just followed. It looks great. Yeah. Cool. Well, you guys got anything else for this week? <laughs> okay. I guess that's no. All right. Cool. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. Glad to be back, and uh, we'll see you next time. Later. <laughs> Is that how you're going to end it with noises? <laughs> yeah. I love you in this one. <laughs>